What's up guys and gals? Welcome back to Shadowrun Dragonfall. My name is Splattercat and I'm happy to have you here today as we run through the shadows once more. In the previous episode, it had gotten all 1997 up in here so that we had to go find ourselves a DVD player. And I haven't seen anybody be that desperate for a DVD player since right before the turn of the millennium. But in any case, it's going to be super awesome because once we get one, we'll be able to watch Equilibrium and also figure out who may have killed our best friend. And so I think the game... Well, the first thing I want to do, before we go any further, let's go to the Talismongers. And I think he was down here somewhere. Talismonger! Where are you? I'm all disoriented. There he is, Talismonger. Let's go on down to the Talismongers. And I wanted to spend a little bit of money working on my spells. Now, I've been thinking about this in my off time. And I think I'm going to switch more towards the mage end of the spectrum, just using my totem as an extra ability. Let's talk to Goldie Eye Girl. Absinthe keeps her eyes hidden from view. Please excuse me, I have work to do. Well, I guess that's that. Let's go talk to Algernon then, since he's the guy who's packing the goods. And he says hello again. General pleasantries. We're not going to do like the random vendor stuff. Let's ask him some questions. I have a question for you, if you don't mind. You're in luck. I have a great many answers. What kind of magic do you practice? Shamanic? Hermetic? Personally, the true kind, but I sell goods tailored to all traditions. In my shop, we do not discriminate. Anything else you need to know? What's the deal with your assistant? There's something funny about her eyes. Absinthe is a friend, nothing more. She helps out around the shop when the fancy strikes her. She's nobody's assistant, and I am no one's master. But her eyes? He pauses for a moment, considering. I believe that they suit her personality. Anything else? What's your story? Have you been in the cruise bays or long? I have many stories. Stories of dancing spirits and raging dragons, of unchecked magic and swarming chaos. All of these stories are true. As for the cruise baser, I've always been here, quietly peddling my wares. It's a simple life, but a good one. Let's ask what he's selling. Let's see if we can't rope ourselves anything else. So I did want to get an apprentice outfit. Let me look at my stats first and foremost, so that I can figure out what I'm tailored for. It's been a day or two since I played last. I know I always lead off like that, but it's my go-to excuse. I try to spend a little bit of time before each episode re like kind of acclimatizing myself, or re uh, like kind of gaining the climate of the game, I suppose, and figuring out where I want things to go. So Charisma, we've got a lot of points in Charisma. I think I'm going to start focusing a bit more on spell casting too, because I would like to have some spellbook slots that are a bit more useful to me. And as I recall, so we've got haste, we've got barrier, we've got heal wound. So what I'd like to consider is maybe swapping in an attack spell of some sort here, kind of an AoE, something that might be useful since we're going to be planning on replacing our other mage. Oop, I don't want to talk to you. I have nothing to say to you, goldy-eyed lady. Away from me, Goldschlager. And so, let's see what he's selling. Power Bolt would be nice. But I think the first thing that I'd like to grab is going to be Mana Ball for 10 AoE damage. Yeah, that seems like something that would be nice to have. So we'll take Power Ball right there, Mana Ball. It's not Power Ball. We're not gambling every time we cast it. Although I suppose we might be. And Mana Bolt is the other go-to spell that people tend to pack as mages. But for now, I think I'm going to go for the Apprentice Outfit so that we have a better uniform. So we've got a couple of extra stats. And so we'll confirm that. That puts us down to 900 New Yen, which is going to be a little bit lower than I'd like to be. But it's okay. It's my online life is starting to look like, or my Shadowrun life is sort of starting to look like the life that I tailor here in real life. Just broke all the time and not sure where all my money went. Let's equip our goods before we go any further, just in case we get ourselves into trouble. I should probably also drop off some of this equipment, considering we have no throwing skill. I'd also like to spend some money on medical supplies. Between here and maybe the next episode. I don't know how I upgrade. I'd like to get Mana Ball 2 or 4. 2, 3, or 4. It's a little bit better and does more damage. For now, I think it's going to force me to go back to my stockpile. So let's go back to the stockpile. And once we are back at the stockpile, that's going to be where we can swap our loot out, I think. Did I even buy it? Hold on. I know I had problems with this before. Yeah, I did buy it, but I think I sent it to my my storage facility. So let's go back to our locker. So I'm spending a little bit of time doing the roundabout method for getting anything else done. I do have a problem where occasionally when I log back into our little base area, I can't act, like interact with objects or anything like that. Another bug. I've had a lot of bugs playing through the game. Like, a ton of bugs. There it is right there. So we're going to equip that. And we've got our secure shaman clothing. That's the clothing we wear when we need to feel like everything's all right in the world. But for now, we want this one. It doesn't appear to look any different. 
Oh, it does. We've got like a cool little coat thing going on. We got kind of a bandana hood. Nice. Let's check our computer over here because in the previous episodes we had also sold off some equipment. Your workstation admission computer. Yes, yes, yes. So we have one unread message. Let's check the new messages. To three toe, we would like to arrange a meeting between you and one of our representatives. You'll find him at the cafe nearby. His name is Luca Dwyer. He will be expecting you. Come alone. Okay. Let's go and check the Shadowland BBS. And claim payment for sold data. Nice. So we got ourselves 550. Oh, never mind. So there was escrow in it as well. So we got ourselves 495 new yen for our future expenditures. We don't have anything else to sell, I don't think. Yeah, so we have nothing to go there. Let's see if there's any jobs around. As of right now, it doesn't appear as though there's anything waiting for us. So we can go to the cafe. It looks like we've got a little bit of a split in the road. We've got a fork in the road. We've got to choose which way we want to go. I'm talking about forks, getting me hungry right now. I only had a granola bar today. I haven't fueled myself properly. I don't have all the caloric intake that I need right now, but we will shadow run anyways because our character's skinny, so we're going to take after that. We have the cafe was down here, so let's go see what the side mission might be because we could use all the extra money we can get when you're running in the shadows. It never hurts to have a little bit of extra scratch in your pocket to make life work out. Kami over here, let's talk to her. She tips an invisible hat. Hey there, remember me from the cafe? My name's Kami. You looking for something? Well, who you are for one thing. I'm Al Tug's ears and hands outside of the cafe. Call me Kami. I wear a couple hats, a barista, a gopher, keep my eyes and ears open. Let's just say that I get on by trading stories, so I can count on you to hear what's going on. Like I said, only if you've got something juicy for me, or if Altug wants me to tell you something, but that's rare. I may be his ears and hands, but he's got enough of a voice all by himself. Doesn't appear to be afraid to use it either. Not in the slightest. Since you moved here, I have some advice. If you haven't guessed already, he's got fingers in a lot of pies. I've seen what happens when he doesn't approve of someone or something. Pissing him off can't be worth it, and at the very least, you won't be able to get good coffee in this town again, she grins cheekily. So what's the story between you and Altug? She grins and winks lachivously at you. Oh, surely you've guessed. You're not serious, she laughs. I can't pull a fast one on you, can I? Well, I'll tell you the real story sometime. How about that? Right now, I've got some errands to run. Come over sometime and we can chat over hookah or something, yeah? She lazily tips an invisible hat at you before turning her focus to a calm at her wrist. Alright, tried to pull a fast one to make it sound like he was getting laid, but nope, I knew it was better than that. They're not jamming. That's the slang term in Shadowrun for getting it on. You talk to Blitz, who's hanging out here. We've also got Luca Dwer, and we've got Al Tugberg Ghazi. Let's talk to our teammate first, and we'll get him squared away. Blitz seems to have found a home for himself here at Cafe Jezve. Somebody told me that the C makes a J sound right there, Jezve. You find him jacked into a portable terminal lounging in a haze of applewood tobacco. He appears to be supremely at ease. He lazily turns his head at the sound of your approach. Without a word, he sighs and jacks out of the terminal. Hey, you chief. Uh, you need something? Just checking in. You doing all right? His smile widens. Great, chief. I'm doing just great. It's real nice to be able to wind down and relax for a change. No more worrying about this ganger, that ganger, sneaking around behind me or slipping a knife between my ribs. He slaps the table with a grin. It's a good change, chief, I gotta say. Well, no one is ever really safe. Not when gangs are involved. Don't let your guard down. His smile widens and he taps his chest. You can see the outline of a machine pistol through the, le the leather of his jacket. You underestimate me, Chief. I never let my guard down. Not even here. Any thoughts about the run you'd like to share? Well, I wasn't around for most of it, but you got me out of that hotel, and for that you've got my eternal thanks. Now that you've settled in, I've got some questions for you. Blitz glances wistfully back at the terminal on the table, then turns with a sigh of resignation. I suppose, but try and keep it short, alright, Chief? I got things to do. How long were you in the Drogan Keeper? I ended up there after the Anarchist Revolution of 39. I was a lost kid back then, too young to realize how good I was, how much money I could have made working in the shadows. He shakes his head, a wistful expression on his face. And so, being young and dumb, I fell in with a gang crowd. And that was that. You were a member of a drug gang? Why should I trust you? Why wouldn't you, Chief? I mean, just look at me. He does his best to give you a winning smile. I'm a trustworthy guy. Prove it. Tell me about the gang that you ran with. Well, I don't know all that much, Chief. I wasn't a member of the gang leadership or anything. I'm not really sure why you care, either. Consider it a test. I need to know where your loyalties lie. He rolls his eyes. If that's what it'll take for you to trust me, then fine. Anything for you, Chief. Well, where to begin? When I first arrived in the Drogan Keep, I spent some time taking in the lay of the land. The Schwarzerzen was still a pretty small gang, strictly street level, but I could see they were going places. I did a little pro bono decking for the leader, a fat little dwarf named Dieter. Soon enough, I was part of the family. 
For a drug gang, the Schwarzherzen were decent enough folk. I made a lot of money with them, helped them take the hotel in the first place, and we had a lot of good years there. Then Dieter was killed in a firefight, and our happy little family fell apart. Was that when the hotel got attacked? Blitz takes another deep breath and shifts his weight from one foot to the other. Not exactly. The Schwarzherzen maintained their hold on the Drogan Keepa, but the change of leadership was bad news for me. After Dieter kicked the bucket, his second in command took over. She is a real piece of work. Called herself Leone Luster. She had a vicious streak a mile long, and she was none too fond of me. Can't imagine, did she turn on you? <laughs> Immediately. I don't know why. Maybe she felt threatened by my friendship with Dieter back before he ate that bullet. Or maybe she was just jealous of my rugged good looks. Who the hell even knows? The point is, she went after me, vigorously, giggity. Within 24 hours of Dieter's death, I had a price on my head, and the hotel got taken over. So that's what you need to know about the Schwarzherzen. They were a great gang, and a powerful one. I helped to make them that way. But then they had that management turnover, and everything went to hell. Blitz rocks back on his feet, his hands in his pockets. That's it. End of story. Anything else you want to talk about? Wait a second. Ooh, we've got a we've got a intelligence check right here. So wait a second. That isn't it. There's some pretty big holes in the story. Come on, boss. That's all ancient history. Wouldn't you rather talk about the future, the runs we're going to go on, all that money we're going to make? Blitz. Tell me what happened between Luster putting the price on your head and the hotel getting attacked. All right, chief. Fine. If that's what it takes, I'll make <laughs> If that's what it'll take to make you happy. So I was in a bide, right? The members of the Schwartz hurts and were loyal to Lester and were all out for my blood. None of the others were going to stick their necks out for me. The advantage of being a ganger is protection and numbers. When those numbers turn against you, you've got to get creative if you want to stay alive. So what did you do? Blitz taps the plastic of his data jack. What I had to do, Lester declared war on me, so I retaliated and I won. All without ever firing a shot. That's not an answer. Blitz sighs. You won't be satisfied until I spell it out for you, will you? All right, fine. I hacked into Lester's computer and sent all of her information to a rival organization. Remember Frank from the hotel? He was my liaison. They hit the Schwarzherzen and they hit him hard. Then they took the hotel and, well, then they took me. I'll admit that part of the plan backfired a little. <laughs> and so he betrayed his gang. Well, I guess they betrayed him too. If you get greenlit, you gotta do what you gotta do to keep your, keep your head in one piece to maintain the status of having a neck. Well, you did what you had to do. In your place, I'd probably have done the same thing. Blitz lets out a sigh of relief. Thanks, Chief. I knew you'd understand. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to get back to what I was doing. He gives you a lazy salute. We'll talk later, I'm sure. And, Chief, I'm glad to be part of this team. Let's hit up our liaison, as everybody's been putting it lately. Ooh, another man with an appreciation for the sidebirds. Although he's got a soul patch, so I don't trust him. Them soul patches. Never trust a man in a bowler cap with a soul patch. Hello, so you're three two, eh? Good. You looked the part. Let me get right down to business. My organization would like to pay you handsomely to take care of some business for us. All you've got to do is continue your work, and we'll be in touch periodically to ask you to complete very simple tasks. How do you know so much about me? My organization knows everything worth knowing in Germany, including this small pond that is Berlin. It's in our best interest, however, to remain unknown. This much is all that I will tell you. Well, he's well-dressed. He's put together, he's got information, and he called Berlin a small pawn. Anybody that refers to it that nonchalantly, any large city center in Shadowrun, tends to be its own like macrocosm, where all kinds of crazy well, I guess I'll say it's its own microcosm, where it's got all of its own factions that are vying for the attentions of whoever's in power, and also those people who are in power are constantly making power plays, trying to get what they want, and so I can assume it's only the same here as it might be in the free Californian state, or as it would be in Seattle. So if he's referring to Berlin, a major city, as a small pond, it may be good to be on his side. Sure, why not? I can only assume that this guy is going to be sort of like in Shadowrun Returns. We had another guy who was the exact same thing. He would call us periodically when we would take a job and he would just add an extra objective. He would be a bonus objective supplier and maybe just get paid a little bit more for being on his side. Sure, I'm in. Good, don't worry. I'll be in touch. When I contact you with a new task, you can still take it or leave it. If you take it, return here, and I'll pay you a fair sum for your services. And if you leave it, my organization will be quite unhappy. I would advise compliance, but there's always some margin for extenuating circumstances. Well, that's no good. That sounded a little bit threatening. Sounds as though we've made a frenemy. We'll talk to Altug over here, too. The Turk leans into you, keeping his voice low. I have information regarding that matter my people were looking into, Effendim. The one involving the surveillance device on my data tap. Altug! I've been waiting for my coffee for nearly an hour already. You growing the beans out back? The coffee vendor shouts, Can't you see I'm speaking to an honored guest, you tower of quivering corpulence? His voice lowers again. Now then, as I was saying, we were fortunate enough that you happened upon that surveillance tap when you did. The people on the other end were planning a very, very bad thing, to be sure. A very bad thing? 
Quite bad, yes. Monica Schaefer was an important member of this community. More than most were aware of, this keys was under her protection. You know how it is in the flux, Ephedim. The, the governance of a place like this is tenuous at best. You never know who's going to be in charge from one day to the next. But Monica was a stabilizing force, and not just because she was dangerous. She was smart and funny, and wise, and she had a way with people. They wanted to support her, to follow her, because they loved her. When she was killed, it left an opening for others. It would have meant bloodshed and pain if this council had not been allowed to continue their plan. But they did not. We saw to it, you and I. So what happened to them? They've been reasoned with. Let's simply say the matter is settled and leave it at that. The cruise baser will maintain its stability a while longer thanks to us. Now what can I do you for, Effendim? Would you like some coffee, perhaps? Coffee? As in real coffee? Not soy calf? Yes, for individuals of refined taste, I offer genuine bean coffee from my native Turkey. The cafe owner looks you in the eye. The tone of his voice grows low and serious. This is a top shelf item, my friend, and not for the general public. Only for those few discerning connoisseurs who can properly appreciate it. Alright, well, we'll keep it. Yeah, I think I'm the sort who can appreciate it. Tell me about the Turkish coffee. It's hand-picked by my family in Turkey, a true delicacy of the sixth world. This would be considered a luxury even before the awakening, when bean coffee was everywhere, every street corner, they say. Burak Ghazi leans in close, lowering his voice to a cons conspiratorial whisper. Long hours in the shop have perfumed his body with the commingled scents of coffee, incense, and applewood tobacco. Trust me, if your coffee experience has been limited to soy calf, you must not deny yourself this opportunity. You will see God. Alright, you sold me. How much? This is a specialty item, delivered at some cost. I can't part with it for less than 50 nuya in a cup. Yeah, pay the man. Let's do this thing. Very good. Burak Ghazi hands you a ceramic travel cup, which he then fills to the brim with dark, steaming liquid. The scent is intoxicating. Is there anything more I can get you? Just killing time. I'll be gone now. If he offered it, the thing is with men who have connections like that, if somebody offers you something, so for example, well, I'm not going to go that deep into it, but if somebody offers you something clandestine or something that's hard to get a hold of, it means that they're offering you an opportunity. It's basically a, biz a business transaction, though you may not know what you're entering into. If somebody offers you a delicacy like that, even if you don't like it, you should probably just stomach it and go for it, especially if you're from different cultures. And so, you don't want to offend him, and since he's going to be our information broker for the remainder of the game, I think it's going to be in our best interest to be like, pay the man. Throw a little bit of money around, it never hurts to grease the palm, like, I could pay him for information, or I could pay him for coffee now, and maybe later on down the line he'll remember the fact that he and I had that pleasant conversation, I might get it for free. I don't know if that's how it's going to work within the confines of the game, but what I will say is that being the astute broker that I am, the shadow runner that I have been over the last 10 years or so, so yeah, it's probably a good idea. Let's talk to Shradi. A stout old man looks up from whatever old tech he's tinkering with to squint at you through the thick, old-fashioned glasses. He pushes them up with an oil-stained finger as he straightens up to nod at you. He speaks with a gruff but well-meaning tone, heavily accented with German tonality. Guten Tag, what can I do for you? Malie tells me you're the man to speak to about DVDs. The little shrew sent you my way, huh? Shradi's smile broadens. Well, well, wonders never cease. Well, introductions are in order, I suppose. Shroddy Buckman at your service. The old man raises a grimy hand in salute. Need something salvaged? Some old components? Oh, God. There's another enormous word. Velect? I'm indeed your man. I don't know. You guys can let me know down below, as always. Wonderful. How about that DVD player? Well, let's see. I think I got something that'll work for you. Shroddy rummages through the junk heaped on the table behind him. A few seconds later, he snatches a battered plastic lozenge shape from the pile. And here we go, an old Korean player that I dug up last week. 2010 model, a real beauty. Shroddy's smile broadens and he gives you a conspiratorial wink. They really like the word conspiratorial. I fixed her up and got her running, but without any discs to read, I've mostly been using her as a paperweight. Sounds like what I'm working for. How much you want for it? Shroddy glances back at the DVD player, a rueful expression on his face. Well, I'll admit I'm a little loath to part with her. There are plenty of folks out there who'd really appreciate an older player like this. And I don't know what your intentions are for it. I suppose, given the time and trouble I took putting her back together, then I'd be willing to part with her for, oh, say, Shroddy's eyes dart over your gear, a calculated expression on his face. How about 500 new yen? Let's see if maybe I'm short on cash right now. Could I offer you something in trade? The old man pauses for a moment, considering. I'll tell you what, a few months ago I had a, well, a difference of opinion with that Burak Ghazi fellow from the soy calf shop. He hasn't let me into his establishment since, and I'd sell my mother for a decent cup of coffee. You get me a cup of Turkish coffee, the real stuff, not that fake shit, and I'll give you the DVD player. Sound like a deal? 
Well, it just happens. We just happen to have some coffee. Hand over the coffee. As it happens, I have a mug right here, Chummer. Ah, thank you. Shradi gratefully accepts the coffee, then snaps the lid back and inhales deeply, wiggling his mustache as he processes the scent. Yep, that's the real stuff, all right. Shradi gingerly picks up the ancient device from the table and presses it into your hands. The plastic is scuffed and worn, and it rattles a bit when you move it. Give her some good use, all right? Cool. So let's return to Paul. And hopefully Amps will have something for us to do. I've heard, I've talked to a couple of people who are well connected in the Shadowrun modding community. And they've been really, really impressed about the way that this game has turned out. They've beaten it before I have because they have the... I don't like to play games side by side. I like to focus on one thing. And also I'd like to process things as they occur for you guys. So that you can see my real kind of reactions as the game takes its twists and turns. So as the Drek starts to hit the fan, I want you guys to be right there along with me for the ride. And so I've been trying to avoid playing ahead of this too far. Now that may backfire on me. I'm I might do some stupid things in the future, but you never know. Amsel, hook me up here. Let's do some stuff. It seems that Amsel has assembled the team in your absence. They stand in a group around the old display that you had Malit deliver. On their faces, you can see excitement and apprehension, curiosity and dread. Three Toe, have you procured have you procured a DVD reader? I have. It's right here. Good. This should only take me a moment. Amsel disappears behind the ancient display. After a few minutes of fiddling with its battered inputs, he reappears, a satisfied look on his face. I look satisfied after I batter an input, too. Everything appears to be functional. The disc should be ready to play. Well, don't keep us in suspense. Start the damn thing already. Three Toe went to the trouble of fetching everything. Let him do the honors. Amsel steps back, clearing a path for you to access the antique machine. Let's do this thing. A soft whirring sound fills the air as the ancient DVD player spins the disc up to speed. The scratched LCD display comes to life and a menu fills the screen. Play track one. Let's go in order. The screen goes black and a cheerful digital chiming sound spills out of the display's speakers. A crackle of static fills the air coupled with a shrill electronic whine. After a few moments, the display goes live and a disheveled looking man appears on the screen. His eyes glitter with excitement. The timestamp on the screen is 2034. The 15th of September, or September the 15th, I guess. 2034, September the 15th. They've got that all weird. If they was in British format, it would be 15th September to 2034. And if it was here in the U.S., it would be the 15th of September <laughs> in 2034. But here, they've just decided to throw me for a loop and make me just kind of pause before I read it. Hermie, I think we found her. After all this time, Firewing, I knew that she wasn't dead. His speech is jittery, and you can hear the urgency in his voice. She survived the Dragonfall, just as I've always said. I knew it. I was right. The screen explodes into static, and the electric whine in the background sharpens into a needle-like pulse of high-pitched sound. Somewhere in the background, Dante lets out a low whimper. The screen clears, and an excited face is closer to the screen than it was before. The words spill out of him in a breathless tide. Taking a team into the socks to retrieve her. The radiation be damned. We'll have the appropriate precautions, of course, but we need to go now. Hermie, I think that the body may be nearby as well. Somehow, it, she, she survived all of this time. The screen explodes into static once again, then clears. The figure flickers across the screen. May not be back for some time. Look after mom, okay? I worry about her. And Hermie, stay safe out there. I know that things are heating up in Berlin, and I know you. Student protests, civil uprising, you'll be in the middle of it, I'm sure. Just stay safe, all right? And I'll do my best to do the same. I don't know what's going on when I step into the socks, but I do know one thing. If the Firewing is a danger, I will put an end to her, once and for all. The display goes black and the background whine fades away. A moment later, you find yourself deposited back at the menu screen. Track number two. The screen goes black for a moment, then a figure appears on the screen. Your late client, Green Winters. His elbow is planted on the table that he's seated at and his chin rests on his palm. The other hand is wrapped around a bottle of cheap whiskey. The timestamp on the video reads Christmas 2053. Found the message that Adrian left me all those years ago. I got it cleaned up the best I could. It's strange hearing his voice again. He paused to take a long pull on the bottle. It's good to hear him, even if he did insist on calling me Hermie. Dr. Adrian Valclair, the hero of the people, Dragon Slayer, and my brother. He grimaces and rubs his eyes. Hard to believe it's almost been 20 years. Alright, so I'm going to start recording these DVDs again for me, for Adrian, and for whoever else might end up watching them. Every time I do this, it winds up feeling like a waste of time, but I keep doing it anyways on the off chance that I'll find something important. If I stumble into the clue that leads me to my brother, I know I'm going to want it on film. I've been doing this for almost 20 years now, after all. No sense in quitting now. Christ. 20 years and all this time, no leads. Even with all of my contacts and all of my resources, it takes another long swallow of cheap liquor. Even with my legendary bullheadedness, I've made no progress at all. I haven't turned up a single goddamn thing. Want to hear something funny? The closest I've gotten to a clue was a rumor. 
Apparently a team emerged from the socks a while back. Nobody's clear on the date, but... And get this, he leans into the camera and gives a conspiratorial wink. Supposedly they vanished without a trace. He upends the bottle and drains it, slams it back down to the table, his eyes rimmed with red. Not much of a rumor, considering... I already know that you're gone, big brother. I live with that every day. Abruptly, Winters leans forward and reaches for the off-screen. The display goes black, and a few seconds later, we're here. Track number three. There's a grinding sound from the DVD tray. Green Winter's image appears on screen. There's an eager look on his face. The timestamp on the video reads 2054, October 12th. Stumbled upon this archival footage of Firewing's original attack. Months before the Dragonfall, easy to forget how devastating it was, Adrian saved a lot of people by bringing her down. I've got the footage all queued up to play, and starting it now, additional comments to follow. The slow whir of the DVD player shifts to a high-pitched whine. A distorted, wavering image blooms into being on the screen. A timestamp in the upper right corner of the screen marks the date, July 6, 2012. It's difficult to make out what you're seeing at first. The scene is dark and smoky, and the telltale flashes of emergency vehicle lights flicker on the periphery of the screen. The camera pushes in, and you can make out two figures standing in a ruined landscape. All at once, the sound cuts in. Again, for those of you just joining us, we are coming to you live from Stolberg. A few hours ago, the Dragon Firewing launched an unprovoked attack on a sleepy Hearts Mountain town, and you can see the results behind me. Fire, ashes, and blood. We are joined tonight by a survivor of the latest and most horrifying attack. The, report, the reporter turns to face a pale man standing behind him. Sir, I understand that you've been through a terrible ordeal. Thanks for taking the time to speak with us tonight. The camera switches focus to a middle-aged man with a haunted look in his eyes. He stammers out a reply. Uh, yeah, of course. If you could, sir, could you please tell the people at home about your experience of the attack? It was, it was horrible. I mean, just pure chaos. So many people are dead. People I knew just roasted alive or trampled to death trying to escape. My own house was burned to the ground during the attack. My my family, we have nothing now. You all made it through the attack though? Your wife? Your children? Yeah, we all made it, thank God. We rode out the attack in a small shelter. Me, my wife, and our two daughters. The shelter it protected us, but the heat was just unbearable. We couldn't have stayed there much longer than we did. How long were you holed up there? Three, maybe four hours? I, I don't know. We just stayed outside, or we just stayed inside until the heat died down and the screaming stopped. And what happened after that? When it was over, you know, the air cooled down. The reporter nods and the man continues. We stepped outside. There was nothing left. Just smoldering wreckage. This dense cloud of black like this oily smoke. The stench in the air. God, that smell. It smelled like roasting meat. There's a long pause and the tortured look on his face. You can tell that the man is struggling to decide whether or not to continue speaking. Eventually, he does. My girls, they they found what was left of her nanny outside her body, and what was left of it was slumped against the shelter door. I keep telling myself that I couldn't hear her pounding to get in, but it wasn't true. I could. I just couldn't bring myself to open that door. I couldn't risk my family like that. Not for her. Not for anyone. Thank you, sir, for taking the time to speak with us. Yeah. You heard it here, an absolutely chilling account of tonight's attack. Again, the town of Stolberg has been reduced to ash, another victim of the Firewing. Stay with us here for more up-to-the-minute reporting on Firewing's reign of terror. Green Winter's face reappears on the screen. Alright, so it's time for a new approach. Adrian's a complete dead end. That much is clear by now, so I'm going to do some digging on Firewing instead. Let's see where this goes. The screen abruptly goes black, and we're here with track number four. The DVD player ramps up to speed, filling the air with a shrill whining sound. The image appears one more time with the timestamp that reads 2054, the 31st of October, Halloween. Well, that was a bust. Little progress update on Firewing, either. He shakes his head. I don't know, it's weird. The information is out there, it's just wrong. Somehow, it's too well, it's too well laid out, too simple. Real life is messy, and this just feels too neat. That's not the only thing that's nagging at me. I'm getting a tingly feeling all up and down the back of my neck again. It feels like I'm being tracked. I'm no Matrix hotshot like Clockwork or Schaefer, but I'm good enough to know when somebody's hot on my scent. Gotta install some new security measures. I, I can't be too careful. Track number five. The display goes blank for a moment. The face of Green Winters winks onto the screen. He's seated at a computer, and to his left, an enormous monitor fills the screen. His voice carries an edge of panic. The timestamp of the video reads 2054, the 9th of November. Christ. I'm getting cl too close to something. There's a trail of bodies, and there have been disappearances. Clockwork, Martian, Peregrine. They've all disappeared within the last few years. Clockwork just went AWOL yesterday, and they were all making the same sorts of inquiries about the Firewing that I've been. There are ghost stories spreading around the Decker community. Stories about Deckers disappearing and then somehow showing up later, but wrong somehow. 
Scary stuff, and I'm starting to think that it's true. Blitz leans in to whisper to you. I know the stories he's talking about, Chief. Never really put too much stock in them. Well, I guess not until now. Could these be the rumors? Be could these rumors be related to what's happening here? Am I being paranoid? He pauses for a moment as if seriously considering the question. Then he shakes his head and slams his fist on the table. No, I don't think so. Something big is happening here, and I'm right in the middle of it. Iger cuts in. That's a bit of a leap. One other thing, Tolstoy told me a story about a kill team that might be related to all of this. Apparently, a Decker named Hellbore posted a theory about Firewing on the Shadowland BBS about, oh, five months ago. About an hour later, a mil-spec team showed up in the meat space and cooked her entire apartment with her in it. If what Tolstoy told me was true, Hellebore live posted the event. She described her killer, this great big orc with skin grafts, then the whole thread disappeared, gone without a trace. Leap, Iger love? Sounds like he's on the right track to me. Iger holds her silent but concedes the point with a small nod. On the screen, Winter pauses. He looks like he's working up something. Finally, he speaks. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. This has got to be Firewing. All of it. Adrian was right about her. She's still alive and she's out of the socks. She's covering her tracks, working the shadows, and preparing to rise again. And that means I have to find you, Adrian, for everyone's sake. Thankfully, I've got a lead. For the first time in two decades, I've got a solid goddamn lead. I've backtracked all of the Matrix node that Hellebore was looking into back to before she got cooked. Whoever's been purging the Matrix didn't think about that, and I found that she turned up... He stabs a few keys on the keyboard, and an image expands to fill the screen of his monitor. A satellite photo of a rural landscape, annotated with GPS data. A set of map coordinates. So now I've got a target. I've got a place to start digging. The Harfeld Manor, conveniently located, isolated stretch of the countryside miles away from prying eyes. Matrix records indicate that some sort of data vault exists beneath the estate, so that's what I need to get into. And this is where we came in. As if on cue, a familiar image winks onto the monitor to Winter's left. Monica. I think I'm going to tap Schaefer on this job. She's got the skills to bypass whatever security they're running out there, and she's gullible enough to make, take the job in the first place. I'll feed her some line about Flux State Security, and she'll eat it up with a spoon. I warned her. Amsel's voice is choked with rage. I warned her. On the display, Winter's mouth parts into a broad grin. Time to put out plans into motion. By this time tomorrow night, I should have the information I need, and on the off chance that Schaefer gets taken out, well, that'll tell me something too. Can't make an omelet and all that. Until then... Winter's image disappears and we're back on track six. Son of a bitch killed our best friend. When you play the sixth track, a small window appears. You recognize the scene in the window. You're looking at the tattered drapes and nicotine stained wallpaper of Winter's hotel room at the Das Kessel house. The timestamp on the video reads 2054, the 10th of November. There's a blur of motion and the haggard form of Green Winter's lumbers into the frame. Suspicions confirmed. Schaefer dead. Christ. Winters reaches a shaking hand off camera. A moment later, it returns clutching a cheap plastic drinking glass. He gulps something down, wipes his mouth with the back of his hand, and then takes a deep breath. Okay, 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 okay. Back up. Slow down. Slow down and start from the beginning. Winters closes his eyes and makes visible effort to calm himself. When he speaks again, his voice is steady. I got the call from my contact in the cruise baser. Schaefer was killed on the estate run. Matrix security at the estate cooked her brain. Considering Schaefer's skill and experience, on-site ice must have been extreme, even by Berlin standards. Security of that kind costs money. Real money. Given the evidence uncovered so far, corporate involvement is unlikely. The connection to Firewing is just too strong. So let's come right out and say it. The dragon is what we're dealing with here, and Smart Money says she's coming for me next. Well, I won't go down without a fight. I've still got my contacts and my connections. The Flux State can be a hell of a weapon for a man who knows how to manipulate it. Winters takes another long pull from his glass, grimaces and swallows. Time for me to make a play. Ghost stories or no, missing deckers or no, I've got to jack into the Matrix and start pulling strings. The countermeasures that I installed earlier should be more than enough to keep me safe for the 20 minutes I'll be in there. Winters drains the rest of the glass, tosses it back over his shoulder, and a moment later you hear the dull clattering sound of hard plastic on linoleum. Schaefer's death is tragic. She was a staunch supporter of the F-State, but still, all things considered. Winters fishes for something off screen. A moment later his hand reappears clutching a data check cable. Better her than me. The plug, He plugs the cable into his hand, and the screen cuts to static. Oh, into his head, I'm sorry. I'm messing with myself again. Eject the DVD. As your finger nears the eject button, a black screen cuts in over the static, and a moment later, Green Winter's haggard face appears. If you're watching this, then I guess they caught up to me. They will be after you too now. Blitz whispers into your ear again more harshly this time. What in the hell is this? Why didn't you warn me about this before I came here? Whisper back, I didn't know, not exactly. Not exactly? I didn't come here to get haunted by a dragon. I'm not even a part of this. You are now, whether you like it, or like it or not, so quiet down and stop bothering him. 
whoever you are, whatever you think you're after, you need to find Dr. Adrian Valclair. Not because he's my brother, because if Firewing is rising again, he's the only one that can stop her. You've seen what happens to people who get too close to this. I'm dead, and dozens of others are dead along with me. You'll be next unless you can find Adrian. The screen cuts to black static. Message over. The DV tree tray slides out of the reader. Well then, we're cutting long for this episode. My name is Splattercat. Thank you for joining me here. I've got class, so I've got to bail out. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Take care out there, everybody, and I look forward to seeing you in the shadows. Be safe, chummers. <laughs>